If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shack True Crime. This is Bruce McGuire. And Maxwell Powers. And Johnny Mills. And we are going over one of the most baffling and long-standing mysteries of all time. That of the demise of one Marilyn Monroe. This has been an incredibly requested case, and it is steeped in mystery and conspiracy, the likes of what most people never really realize, how far some of these rabbit holes go. So like always in typical mind shock fashion, we will be digging deep into every single rabbit hole to see what we can uncover and make some of these pieces fit that don't seem to fit in some of these theories. As always, if you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. If you like the podcast, hit the like button. Feel free to share it across social media platforms like our Facebook page. You could also check us out, Twitter, Reddit, Patreon. All right, so here's the question everybody's been waiting for. Maxwell Powers, do you know who Marilyn Monroe is? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a slow blonde, answer. Miss Blonde Bombshell came to JFK for his birthday. Okay. So, uh, Johnny, I know you've actually mentioned this mystery before. I'm not even sure I looked into it that deep until you mentioned it. I actually always just assumed, I've seen before I researched the case, uh, in the past, years and years ago, I just always assumed it was suicide, and then you kind of mentioned that there were some strange connections, and I started digging, and then there are indeed quite a few strange connections. <laughs> what do you? Uh, what, what's your take on this whole thing? Actually, I don't really know too much about Marilyn Monroe. I thought she just uh, took some pills and just died or something. You were actually, you were actually the one who told me to look into the case. <laughs> Well, I know there was some weird connection with, like, John F. Kennedy, but that was all I really knew. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, once you, start, once you start looking at the autopsy, the medical examiner, the strange issues with the discovery of the body, the ambulance driver. I mean, there were lie detector tests administered. I mean, this whole thing was investigated quite thoroughly, and there are so many pieces that just simply don't add up. Uh, Maxwell, what do you you were aware of her death of her young? She was pretty young when she died, relatively. Were you? What did you think? It was just suicide. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't know how she died back in the day when, but you know, like recently, I came across that she was committed suicide. But yeah, I All didn't right. know how she died the last. Yeah. yeah, let's go over. Yeah, let's go over the background of Marilyn Monroe for people like Maxwell who might have possibly heard who she was, but not really know too well. And there might be some very, very critical clues hidden in her past that could help us decipher this mystery, whether it were links to possible mental insanity or some other connections to some strange people possibly involved in the government, possibly involved in the Illuminati. And we will actually even be getting into some even more mind-shocking theories involving aliens. I'm sure that's what you want to know about, right, Maxwell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, what was she, uh... <laughs> she was abducted or what? <laughs> Not quite, but uh, we'll get to that. So... She was actually born June 1st, 1926, as Norma Jean Mortensen. I don't know, Norma Jean doesn't have the same ring as Marilyn. <laughs> what do you guys think? Yeah, that old name sucked. And she died August 4th, 1962, age 36. Los Angeles, California. Born in Los Angeles, California. So the official cause of death is listed as barbiturate overdose. And she was an actress, model, singer, mostly active between the years 1945 and 1962. Three spouses, James Doherty, Joe DiMaggio, and Arthur Miller. So she was an American actress, model, singer. She was famous for playing the blonde bombshell characters 
and she became one of the most popular, if not the first, worldwide sex symbol of the 1950s and early 1960s. She was a top-billed actress for only a decade, but her films grossed $200 million, which is the equivalent to $2 billion in 2018. Damn, that's a lot. Yeah, once you adjust numbers for inflation, it's kind of insane. It's, it's yeah, that's... That's crazy. So, yeah, more than half a century after her death, she continues to be a major pop culture icon. Born and raised in Los Angeles, Monroe spent most of her childhood in foster homes and an orphanage and was married at the age of 16. While working in the radio plane company in 1944 as part of the war effort during World War II, she was introduced to a photographer from the first motion picture unit and began a successful pinup modeling career. That work led to short-lived film contracts with 20th Century Fox from 1946 to 47 and Columbia Pictures in 1948. After a series of minor film roles, she signed a new contract with Fox in 1951. Over the next two years, she became a popular actress and had roles in several comedies, including As Young As You Feel, and Monkey Business, and in dramas Clash by Night and Don't Bother to Knock. She faced a scandal when it was revealed that she had posed for nude photos before she became a star, but the story did not tarnish her career and instead resulted in increased interest in her films. By 53, Monroe was one of the most marketable Hollywood stars. She had leading roles in the noir film Niagara, the comedies Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and How to Marry a Millionaire, which established her star image as a dumb blonde. And I, I guess that's where the, uh, is that where the archetype comes from? The dumb blonde archetype was Marilyn Monroe, the first of that? <laughs> I'd say so. Yes, yeah, <laughs> possible. The same year, her images were used as the centerfold and in the cover of the first issue of the men's magazine Playboy. Although she played a significant role in the creation and management of her public image throughout her career, she was disappointed when she was typecast and underpaid by the studio. Now, I guess she would have to be underpaid if she's, if she's raking in like $2 billion. Like, how much were they paying her? She was briefly... Maybe, maybe when she was just starting out, though, maybe. I don't know. Well, no, that was the cumulative amount for about a decade. Oh, uh, okay. She was briefly suspended in early 1954 for refusing a film project, but returned to star in one of the biggest box office successes of her career, The Seven Year Itch, in 1955. When the studio was still reluctant to change her contract, she founded a film pr production company in late 1954 and named it Marilyn Monroe Productions. She dedicated 1955 to building her company and began studying method acting at Actors Studio. In late 55, Fox awarded her a new contract, which gave her more control and a larger salary. Her subsequent roles included a critically acclaimed performance in Bus Stop, 56, and the first independent production of MMP, The Prince and the Showgirl, 57. Monroe won a Golden Globe for her best actress for work in Some Like It Hot, 1959 a critical and commercial success. Her last completed film was the drama The Misfits in 1961. Monroe's troubled private life received much attention. She struggled with substance abuse, depression, and anxiety. Her second and third marriages to retired baseball star Joe DiMaggio and playwright Arthur Miller were highly publicized and both ended in divorce. On August 4th, 1962, she died at age 36 from an overdose of barbiturates at her home in Los Angeles. Although Monroe's death was ruled a probable suicide, several conspiracy theories have been proposed in the decades following her death. So in her early life, she was born June 1st, 1926, third child of Gladys Pearl Baker. And that was actually, so her mother's maiden name was Monroe. Gladys was the daughter of two poor Midwesterners who migrated to California. At the age of 15, she married a man nine years her senior, John Newton Baker, and had two children by him, Robert and Bernice. 
Bernice is a pretty good name, right? You guys are you, Maxwell. Uh, we actually haven't asked you. Do you have any kids? <laughs> no kids. I mean, these they sound like fifties names. But Bernice <laughs> is like such an ugly name. Yeah. I was thinking Maxwell would probably name his kid Bernice. Seems like the thing to do. <laughs> she is, plan- that, is Bernice like the the female form of Bernie? Uh, I guess. If Bernie Sanders ever starts identifying as a woman, he'll be Bernice Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she she filed for divorce in 21, and Baker took the children with him to his native Kentucky. Monroe was not told that she had a sister until she was 12 and met her for the first time as an adult. Following the divorce, Gladys worked as a film negative cutter at Consolidated Film Industries. In 1924, she married her second husband, Martin Edward Mortison, but they separated only some months later and divorced in 28. The identity of Monroe's father is unknown, and she most often used Baker as her surname. Although Gladys was mentally and financially unprepared for a child, Monroe's early childhood was stable and happy. Soon after the birth, Gladys was able to place her daughter with foster parents, Albert and Ida Bolander, in the rural town of Hawthorne. They raised their foster children according to the principles of evangelical Christianity. At first, Gladys lived with the Bolenders and commuted to work in L.A. until longer work shifts forced her to move back to the city in early 1927. She then began visiting her daughter on weekends, often taking her to the cinema and to sightsee in Los Angeles. Although the Bolenders wanted to adopt Monroe, by the summer of 1933, Gladys felt stable enough for Monroe to move in with her and bought a small house in Hollywood. They shared it with lodgers. Actors George and Maude Atkinson. Maude, that's another good name. You, you don't really see too many people being named Maude anymore, do you? Is that M-A-U-D? Yes. Ah, that's a weird name, too. <laughs> and their daughter, Nellie. Some months later, in January 1934, Gladys had a mental breakdown and was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. After several months in a rest home, she was committed to the Metropolitan State Hospital. She spent the rest of her life in and out of hospitals and was rarely in contact with Monroe. You know what's weird, though? Do you guys think that these uh, mental issues are as a res- are a result of environment? So Marilyn Monroe's mother, Gladys, so she she got married at fifteen. She got divorced, and at, in that time period, I don't think divorce was that common, right? In the early nineteen hundreds, I would assume. Compared to now, it was it was probably pretty rare. Yeah, I'd say it wasn't as popular back then. Especially, especially with younger people and religious people. I mean, even now, deeply religious people, their divorce rates are actually quite a bit lower. But uh, yeah, especially way back then, and to religious people, it's yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, and then she wasn't told that she had a sister until she was twelve, and she didn't meet her until she was an adult. Do you think this kind of unstable family situation contributes to paranoid schizophrenia? I guess it could, but hmm. yeah, is it like a genetic thing though? So, well, it's, I mean, yeah, depending on what you read, supposedly there's components of everything, just like with every disease, there's some de- genetic predisposition and obviously diet, lifestyle, stress, probably stress has a factor in it. I would, I would think stress is kind of uh, big in everything. Maxwell, any thoughts on this? About uh, uh, I forgot what you said, but something about schizophrenia or something. Contributing factors, because Marilyn Monroe's mother didn't exactly have the most stable life, especially. I mean, it's a lot more of an average life nowadays, but back in the early 1900s, it seems like it was incredibly unstable for the time. Oh, I see. Um, Even for Hollywood. So you, you're. You're saying if if those, she was married, she was married was, at fifteen, married at fifteen, divorced young, had a sister that she didn't know about until she was twelve. I mean, it, it's yeah. The the this is not the average happy, you know, struggling financially, mentally. Although although I have to give her credit, she seemed like she constantly kept in touch with Marilyn the whole time and then she moved she finally got a small house and had her move in with her so this wasn't the case of some kind of an abandonment so that's also important to note when we're dissecting marilyn monroe's life and psychology 
this isn't exactly an abandonment situation. Although she didn't even know who the father, who her father was, huh. and not not to uh, not to get into the gossip realm, but did did uh, did Gladys know who Marilyn Monroe's father was? Because she might have not known exactly either. Huh. Yeah, that's true. So th- these aren't this is, these aren't the most stable of uh, lifestyles. Monroe became a ward of the state, and her mother's friend Grace McKee Goddard took responsibility over her and her mother's affairs. In the following four years, she lived with several foster families and often switched schools. For the first 16 months, she continued living with the Atkinsons and was sexually abused during this time. George and Maud Atkinson. Those were the act. Those were the actors who also had a daughter. Huh. Always a shy girl, she now also developed a stutter and became withdrawn. In the summer of 1935, she briefly stayed with Grace and her husband, Erwin Doc Goddard, and two other families until Grace placed her in the Los Angeles Orphans Home in Hollywood in September 1935. While the orphanage was a model institution and was described in positive terms by her peers, Monroe found being placed there traumatizing. As to her, it seemed that no one wanted me. Encouraged by the orphanage staff who thought that Monroe would be happier living in a family, Grace became her legal guardian in 1936, although she was not able to take her out of the orphanage until the summer of 1937. Monroe's second stay with the Goddards lasted only a few months because Doc molested her. Man, this is rough. It seems like everywhere she's staying, there's some really shady individuals. Wait, which one molested? Which one molested her? Well, this was Doc Goddard, but then also it's this is it's sourced that she, while living with the Atkinsons, who are other actors, she was also abused. Her mother's friend Grace McGee Goddard, that that was her her mother's friend. The husband of her mother's friend was Erwin Doc Goddard. So it seemed like a whole bunch of different people abused her. Which, yeah, that that can't be good. Was that at the foster home or the orphanage or whatever? No. This was no. She, while she was staying with the Goddards for several months. Mm. After staying with several of her relatives and Grace's friends and relatives in Los Angeles and Compton, Monroe found a more permanent home in September 1938 when she began living with Grace's aunt, Anna Atchison Lower, in the Sautel District. She was enrolled in Emerson Junior High School and was taken to weekly Christian science services with Lauer. Monroe was otherwise a mediocre student, but she excelled in writing and contributed to the school newspaper. Due to the elderly Lauer's health issues, Monroe returned to live with the Goddards in Van Nuys in either late 1940 or early 1941. That must have been really sketchy. Like, why would she? That's so weird. That's pretty weird. After graduating from Emerson, she began attending Van Nuys High School. In early 1942, the company that employed Doc Goddard relocated him to West Virginia. California child protection laws prevented the Goddards from taking Monroe out of state, and she faced the possibility of having to return to the orphanage. As a solution, she married their neighbor's 21-year-old son, a factory worker, James Jim Doherty, the wedding took place on June 19, 1942, just after her 16th birthday. Monroe subsequently dropped out of high school and became a housewife. She later stated that the marriage didn't make me sad, but it didn't make me happy either. My husband and I hardly spoke to each other. This wasn't because we were angry. We had nothing to say. I was dying of boredom. In 1943, Doherty enlisted in the Merchant Marine and was stationed on Santa Catalina Island, where Monroe moved with him. This is, she, she had an interview with Life Magazine, 1962, so this would be pretty close to the time of her death. When I was five, I think, that's when I started wanting to be an actress. I loved to play. I didn't like the world around me because it was kind of grim, but I loved to play house. It was like you could make your own boundaries. When I heard that this was acting, I said, that's what I want to be. Some of my foster families used to send me to the movies to get me out of the house, and there I'd sit all day and way into the night. Up in front, there with the screen so big, a little kid all alone, and I loved it. So from 44 to 49, 
is when she entered modeling in her first film roles. In April 44, Doherty was shipped out to the Pacific, where he would be for the next two years. So Marilyn moved in with his parents and began a job at the Radio Plane Company, a munitions factory in Van Nuys. <laughs> Did you guys know that? That Marilyn Monroe worked at making munitions for World War II? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. That's cool. In late 44, she met photographer David Conover who had been sent by the U.S. Army Air Force's first motion picture unit to the factory to shoot morale-boosting pictures of female workers. Although none of her pictures were used, she quit working at the factory in January 1945 and began modeling for Conover and his friends. Defying her deployed husband, she moved on her own and signed a contract with the Blue Book Modeling Agency in August 1945. You know what's crazy? Thinking about this in hindsight, isn't that like a pretty brave thing to do in the 40s? You're a housewife and you just decide to move out on your own and embark on a career. <laughs> That's pretty crazy if you think about it. Uh, yeah, I heard, I heard that about uh, Marilyn Monroe. Like she was a real go-getter, um, but no one really saw her as that like when she was famous, but she was um she was a hard worker, at least that's what I heard from that um, that psycho actress mo mom uh, daughter, what's her name? Um, what? That her mom was in the psycho movie. It was uh, she heard it from her. I heard it from that actress. Anyway, just, wait, uh, Jamie Jamie Lee Curtis? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, the the word that comes to mind for me is bold. Like she must have been pretty bold to just do that like now everybody does that but back then i mean that's crazy as a model monroe occasionally used the name jean norman she straightened her curly brunette hair and dyed it blonde to make herself more employable <laughs> it'd be funny if she was the first uh because before the movie gentlemen prefer blondes i mean was the whole blonde thing that crazy like how many people were became bleached blondes now like the past few decades it's kind of been a big thing I guess starting in the 80s, right? It got really big. But uh, yeah, she did this. Uh, <laughs> she did this in the 40s. <laughs> Her figure was deemed more suitable for pinup than fashion. And she was featured mostly in advertisements and men's magazines. According to Emmeline Snively, the agency's owner, Monroe was one of its most ambitious and hardworking models. By early 46, she had appeared on 33 magazine covers for publications such as Pageant, U.S. Camera, Laugh, and Peak. Through Snively, Monroe signed a contract with an acting agency in June 46. After an unsuccessful interview at Paramount Pictures, she was given a screen test by Ben Lyon, a 20th century Fox executive. Head executive Daryl F. Zanuck who was unenthusiastic about it, but he was persuaded to give her a standard six-month contract to avoid her being signed by rival studio RKO Pictures. Monroe's contract began in August 46, and she and Lyon selected the stage name Marilyn Monroe. The first name was picked by Lyon, who was reminded of Broadway star Marilyn Miller. The last was picked by Monroe after her mother's maiden name. In September 46, she divorced Dougherty, who was against her having a career. Monroe had no film roles during the first few months of her contract and instead dedicated her days to acting, singing, and dancing classes. Eager to learn more about the film industry and in order to promote herself, she spent time at the studio lot to observe others working. Yes, she is a real go-getter. <laughs> her contract was renewed in February 47, and she was given her first two film roles, Bit Parts in Dangerous Years, 47, and Scudahoo Scudahay, 48. I'm sure Maxwell's seen those films, right? Uh, yeah. Really? Nah, I have no fucking idea what they are. <laughs> <laughs> the studio enrolled her in the Actors Laboratory Theater, an acting school teaching the techniques of group theater. She later stated that it was my first taste of what real acting in a real drama could be, and I was hooked. Despite her enthusiasm, her teachers thought her too shy and insecure to have a future as an actress, and Fox did not renew Monroe's contract in 47, in August of 47. She returned to modeling while also doing occasional odd jobs at film studios, such as working as a dancing pacer behind the scenes at musical sets. Monroe was determined to make it as an actress, and she continued studying at the actors' lab, paying for the classes herself. In October 47, she appeared as a blonde vamp in the play Glamour Preferred at the Bliss Hayden Theater, but the production was not reviewed by any major publication and ended after only a few performances. 
To promote herself, she frequented producers' offices, befriended gossip columnist Sidney Skolsky, and entertained influential male guests at studio functions, a practice she had begun at Fox. She also became a friend and occasional sex partner of Fox executive Joseph M. Schenk, who persuaded his friend Harry Cohn, the head executive of Columbia Pictures, to sign her in March 1948. While at Fox, Monroe was given roles of a girl next door. At Columbia, she was modeled after Rita Hayworth. Her hairline was raised and her hair was bleached to platinum blonde. She also began working with the studio's head drama coach, Natasha Lytes, who would remain her mentor until 1955. Her only film at the studio was the low-budget musical Ladies of the Chorus, 1948, in which she had her first starring role as a chorus girl who was courted by a wealthy man. She also screen tested for the lead role in Born Yesterday, 1950, but her contract was not renewed in September 1948. Ladies of the Chorus was released the following month, but was not a success. After Columbia, Monroe became the protege of Johnny Hyde, who was the vice president of the William Morris Agency. Their relationship soon became sexual and he proposed marriage, but Monroe refused. He paid for a silicone prosthesis that was implanted in Monroe's jaw and possibly for a rhinoplasty, and arranged a bit part in the Marx Brothers film Love Happy, 1950. Monroe also continued modeling, and in May 1949, she posed nude for photos taken by Tom Kelly. Although her role for Love Happy was very small, she was chosen to participate in the film's promotional tour in New York that year. So in the, in the 50s were her breakthrough years... And in 53 was her rise to superstardom. She had three movies released in 1953. Niagara, which grossed $6 million at the box office. She won the Fastest Rising Star Award in January 1953. Then the satirical musical comedy Gentlemen Prefer Blondes was released and established her screen persona as a dumb blonde. It grossed $5.3 million, double production costs. In September of that year, Monroe made her television debut on The Jack Benny Show. The th her third film that year, How to Marry a Millionaire, was released in November. $8 million in rentals. Biggest box office success at that point in her career. And she was on the cover and the centerfold of the very first issue of Playboy, December 1953. So her contract didn't change since 1950. So after all those hits and making all that money, she still was paid less than all the other stars, and she could not choose her projects or co-workers. When she refused to shoot another musical comedy, a film version of The Girl in Pink Tights, which was to co-star Frank Sinatra, the studio suspended her January 4th, 1954. You know, it's kind of weird. I'm not sure about the, uh, what the exact details of actors' as contracts are today. But generally, they, they uh, especially the bigger stars, they approve, like, they're, they're not forced to do any films. Like, if you don't want to do a movie, you don't sign the contract to do the movie. You don't get suspended from the studio. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty weird. Huh. But I guess that's how they did things back then. So she married Joe DiMaggio on January 14th, San Francisco City Hall. Then they went to Japan on a combo honeymoon business trip. Is that how you did your honeymoon, Maxwell? <laughs> Maxwell? No. Uh, wait, how did, how did I do it? Well, I'm asking you. I mean, but how did you think that I did it? <laughs> well, what I just said, Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio did a combo honeymoon business trip to Japan. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's a good way to do it. I, I didn't do that. <laughs> In September 54, Monroe began filming Billy Wilder's comedy The Seven Year Itch, where she starred opposite Tom Ewell as a woman who becomes the object of her married neighbor's sexual fantasies. Although the film was shot in Hollywood, the studio decided to generate advanced publicity by staging the filming of a scene on Lexington Avenue in Manhattan. In the shoot, Monroe is standing on a subway grate with the air blowing up the skirt of her white dress, which became one of the most famous scenes of her career. The shoot lasted for several hours and attracted a crowd of nearly 2,000 spectators, including professional photographers. And that's probably one of the most famous uh, photos ever, right? Doing the skirt thing? 
Yeah, the Subway Grape from the Seven Year Itch. Yeah, it's probably her most popular one. I think they made a statue out of that or something. Huh. Seven Year pub- Itch? Yeah, the publicity stunt placed Monroe on international front pages, and it also marked the end of her marriage to DiMaggio, who was furious about the stunt. The union had been troubled from the start by his jealousy and controlling attitude. Spotto and Banner have also alleged that he was physically abusive. After Wait, Monroe- is that was that a was that a planned thing or is that something that she walked by and then they took photographs or I don't know. Were you, were you not that. were you not paying attention? No, I was not paying attention. So they were recreating a scene from the movie, so it was all com- it was all planned. Yeah. Okay, why do you keep asking me if I wasn't paying attention? Like I, I wasn't. <laughs> well, maybe you should. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, been fifth forty episodes <laughs> you got to keep trying well some of the i don't know some of the podcasts you do pay attention so i don't know and, and and those that you do i don't ask you that because you you're up to date you're up to speed and you're giving relevant information so i don't need to ask that question but uh after filming for the seven year itch wrapped in november monroe began a new battle for control over her career and left Hollywood for the East Coast. Is it, it looks like the East Coast West Coast thing started way earlier than the uh, rap wars. What, what do you think, Johnny? That yeah, beef was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn Monroe versus Hollywood. <laughs> she and photographer Milton Green founded their own production company, Marilyn Monroe Productions, an action that has been called instrumental in the collapse of the studio system. Announcing its foundation to the press in January 55, Monroe stated that she was tired of the same old sex roles. I want to do better things. People have scope, you know. She asserted that she was no longer under contract to Fox, as the studio had not fulfilled its duties, such as paying her her promised $100,000 bonus for the seven-year itch. This began a year-long legal battle between her and the studio. The press largely ridiculed Monroe for her actions, and she was parodied in the seven-year itch writer George Axelrod's Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter, 1955, in which her lookalike, Jane Mansfield, played a dumb actress who starts her own production company. That's kind of messed up. It, was she, like, the first actress to ever start her own production company? I'm not sure. I mean, 55 was, uh, I mean, that wasn't that long ago. But um, I would assume she'd be she'd be one of the first. That's a, again another bold move, and they're making fun of her for it. That's kind of messed up. Monroe dedicated 1955 to studying her craft. She moved to Manhattan and took acting classes with Constance Collier and attended workshops on method acting at the Actors Studio run by Lee Strasberg. She grew close to Strasberg and his wife Paula, receiving private lessons at their home due to her shyness, and soon became a family member. She dismissed her old drama coach, Natasha Lightest, and replaced her with Paula. The Strasbergs remained an important influence for the rest of her career. Monroe started undergoing psychoanalysis at the recommendation of Strasberg, who believed that an actor must confront their own emotional traumas and use them in their performances. You guys think that's kind of a dangerous thing to do? I don't know. What's a dangerous thing to do? The psychoanalysis stuff? For an actor to confront their emotional traumas and use them in their performances, mm. especially that that method acting. There, there a lot of a lot of people do that technique. Like they kind of like bring up their old shit and then they bring it to the scene. Yeah, I know. But if it's if it's really deeply traumatic, like her life, I mean, that's not the run of the mill. Oh, you broke up with your boyfriend, or you know, you had a loved one die. I mean, yeah, you. I mean, obviously, for things like that, everybody goes through that. You could use it in acting. But, I mean, she was abused by all these different people. Her mother went insane. Like, th- this is a step beyond, like, the norm. Is it, is it kind of dangerous to be doing that? I don't know. I can't, I can't help but what think there were definite psychological aspects to her, uh, to her life that had something to do. Well, obviously, if she committed suicide, it had something to do with her demise. But if she became involved in some kind of a conspiracy, did these play a role? In her private life, Monroe continued her relationship with DiMaggio despite the ongoing divorce proceedings. She also dated actor Marlon Brando and playwright Arthur Miller. She had first been introduced to Miller by Kazan in the early 1950s. The affair between Monroe and Miller became increasingly serious after October 1955 when her divorce from DiMaggio was finalized and Miller separated from his wife. The FBI also opened a file on her. 
Is it common for the FBI to open files on famous actors and actresses? Probably. Maybe. The studio feared that Monroe would be blacklisted and urged her to end the affair as Miller was being investigated by the FBI for allegations of communism and had been subpoenaed by the House of Un-American Activities Committee. <laughs> Despite the risk to her career, Monroe refused to end the relationship, later calling the studio heads born cowards. That's pretty bold as well. You think the FBI has a file on, like, Tom Cruise? Scientology's taken over. Are you a Scientologist, Maxwell? They probably have files on, like, everybody, though, but... I mean, good or bad, I guess. Maxwell, you're a Scientologist? No, uh, I don't. I don't really. I don't really understand it. What is Scientology? Is it just science? <laughs> oh man, that's funny. Uh, we probably have to do a dedicated podcast on Scientology and all that it entails. It's got some sci-fi origins, but it has some uh, interesting views about a lot of things as well. But uh, yeah, it's it's pretty weird. So you're a Scientologist? Uh, no, I am not. <laughs> Like I said, it's pretty weird. A little too weird for me. By the end of the year, Monroe and Fox had come to an agreement about a new seven-year contract. It was clear that MMP would not be able to finance films alone, and the studio was eager to have Monroe working again. The contract required her to make four movies for Fox during seven years. She'd be paid $100,000 for each movie and granted the right to choose her own projects, directors, and cinematographers. She would also be free to make one film with MMP per each completed film for Fox. That's not a bad contract. 56 to 59, Monroe began 1956 by announcing her win over in 20th Century Fox. The press, which had previously derided her, now wrote favorably about her decision to fight the studio. Time called her a shrewd businesswoman, and Look predicted that the win would be an example of the individual against the herd for years to come. In March, she officially changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. Her relationship with Miller prompted some negative comments from the press, including Walter Winchell's statement that America's best-known blonde moving picture star is now the darling of the left-wing intelligentsia. Monroe and Miller were married in a civil ceremony at the Westchester County Court in White Plains, New York on June 29th, and two days later had a Jewish ceremony at the Wacobuck, New York home of Kay Brown, who was Miller's literary agent. With the marriage, Monroe converted to Judaism, which led Egypt to ban all of her films. <laughs> Did you know about that, Johnny? No, nah, I didn't know about that. That's kind of weird, though. So wasn't Egypt like... Isn't Egypt kind of Arab and they're sort of conservative, right? Why were her films not banned before that? I mean, I, I would assume like that those kind of uh, those kinds of American films uh, were they really that popular in Arab countries? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just a weird time back then. <laughs> Maxwell, any thoughts on that? No, I'm not. I'm not familiar with those uh, religions, and I'm not really. Yeah, I'm not really good at that. <laughs> Due to Monroe's star image as a sex symbol and Miller's position as an intellectual, the media saw the union as a mismatch. This was demonstrated by Variety's headline, Egghead Weds Hourglass. That's kind of weird. So she had a whole bunch more uh, successful films. In August, she got a Golden Globe for Best Actress for her performance in Bus Stop. In August 1956, Monroe began filming MMP's first independent production, The Prince and the Showgirl, at Pinewood Studios in England. It was based on Terence Rattigan's The Sleeping Prince, a play about an affair between a showgirl and a prince in the 1910s. The main roles had first been played on stage by Lawrence Oliver and Vivian Lee. He reprised his role and directed and co-produced the film. The production was complicated by conflicts between him and Monroe. He angered her with patronizing statements, all you have to do is be sexy, and his attempts to get her to replicate Lee's interpretation. He also disliked the constant presence of Paula Strasberg, Monroe's acting coach, on set. In retaliation to what she considered Oliver's condescending behavior, Monroe deliberately arrived hours late and became uncooperative, stating later, if you don't respect your artists, they can't work well. Her drug use escalated, and according to Spato, she became pregnant and miscarried during the production. 
She also had arguments with Green over how MMP should be run, including whether Miller should join the company. Despite the difficulties, the film was completed on schedule by the end of the year. It was released to mixed reviews in June 1957 and proved unpopular with American audiences. It was better received in Europe, where she was awarded the Italian David D. Donatello and the French Crystal Star Awards and was nominated for a BAFTA. After returning to the U.S., Monroe took an 18-month hiatus from work to concentrate on married life on the East Coast. She and Miller split their time between their Manhattan apartment and an 18th century farmhouse that they purchased in Roxbury, Connecticut. They spent the summer in Amagansett, Long Island. She became pregnant in mid-1957, but it was ectopic and had to be terminated. An ectopic pregnancy is a complication of pregnancy in which the embryo attaches outside of the uterus. Yeah, she had a really troubled life. She suffered a miscarriage a year later. Her gynecological problems were largely caused by endometriosis, a disease from which she, su she suffered throughout her adult life. Monroe was also briefly hospitalized during this time due to a barbiturate overdose. During the hiatus, she dismissed Green from MMP and bought his share of the company as they could not settle their disagreements, and she had begun to suspect that he was embezzling money from the company. You know what's crazy, though? If you were going to murder Marilyn Monroe or someone of that nature who has known drug problems, wouldn't you stage it as an overdose? Because nobody would question that, right? Especially if that person had overdosed previously. Yeah, that's the way, that's the way it would be done. See, I didn't have to ask you if you were paying attention, Maxwell. <laughs> I, I only listened to that last part. I don't, I don't know what you said. To... Most, of my question, most of my questions are like that. Monroe returned to Hollywood in July 1958 to act opposite Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis in Billy Wilder's comedy on gender roles, Some Like It Hot. Although she considered the role of Sugar Cane another dumb blonde, she accepted it due to Miller's encouragement and the offer of receiving 10% of the film's profits in addition to her standard pay. The difficulties during the film's production have since become legendary. Monroe would demand dozens of retakes and could not remember her lines, uh, she sounds like she's having Maxwell problems, or act as directed. Curtis famously stated that kissing her was like kissing Hitler due to the number of retakes. Does that statement make any sense to anybody? Johnny Maxwell, what, what the heck does that mean? I guess it's like the worst person possible or something, right? Yeah, but he said it was like kissing Hitler due to the number of retakes. So, like, I think most people would be happy to do as many retakes as possible, right? Wait, who said that? The guy that had to kiss her. Huh. Did she have a mustache? It was, like, rubbing on his face too much? <laughs> Monroe herself privately likened the production to a sinking ship and commented on her co-stars and directors saying, but why alter many of her scenes, which in turn made her stage fright worse? And it is suggested that she deliberately ruined several scenes to act them her way. Wait. In the end, Wilder was happy with Monroe's performance and stated, anyone can remember lines, but it takes a real artist to come on set and not know her lines and yet give the performance she did. Was that a, is that a backhanded compliment or something? <laughs> Despite the difficulties of its production, Some Like It Hot became a critical and commercial success when it was released in March 1959. Monroe's performance earned her a Golden Globe for Best Actress and prompted Variety to call her a comedian, with that combination of sex appeal and timing that just can't be beat. It has been voted one of the best films ever made in polls by the BBC, the American Film Institute, and Sight and Sound. From 1960 to 1962, her career declined and even more personal difficulties. After Some Like It Hot, Monroe took another hiatus until late 1959 when she returned to Hollywood and starred in the musical comedy Let's Make Love about an actress and a millionaire who fall in love when performing in a satirical play. She chose George Cukor to direct and Miller rewrote portions of the script, which she considered weak. She accepted the part solely because she was behind on her contract with Fox, having only made one of four promised films. The film's production was delayed by her frequent absences from the set. Monroe and her co-star, Yves Montand, had an affair which was widely reported by the press and used in the film's publicity campaign. Let's Make Love was unsuccessful upon its release in September 1960. 
Crowther described Monroe as appearing rather untidy and lacking the old Monroe dynamism. And Hedda Hopper called the film the most vulgar picture she's ever done. Truman Capote lobbied for her to play Holly Golightly in a film adaptation of Breakfast at Tiffany's, but the role went to Audrey Hepburn as its producers feared that Monroe would complicate the production. <laughs> the last film that Monroe completed was John Huston's The Misfits, which Miller had written to provide her with a dramatic role. She played Rosalind, a recently divorced woman who becomes friends with three aging cowboys played by Clark Gable, Eli Wallach, and Montgomery Clift. The filming in Nevada desert in the Nevada desert between July and November 1960 was again difficult. The four-year marriage of Monroe and Miller was effectively over, and he began a new relationship with set photographer Ing Morath. Monroe disliked that he had based her role partly on her life and thought it inferior to the male roles. She also struggled with Miller's habit of rewriting scenes the night before filming. Her health was also failing. She was in pain from gallstones, and her drug addiction was so severe that her makeup usually had to be applied when she was still asleep under the influence of barbiturates. In August, filming was halted for her to spend a week detoxing in a Los Angeles hospital. Despite her problems, Houston stated that when Monroe was playing Rosalind, she was not pretending to an emotion. It was the real thing. She would go deep down within herself and find it and bring it up into consciousness. Monroe and Miller separated after filming wrapped, and she was granted a quick divorce in Mexico in 1961. The Misfits was released the following month, but it failed at the box office. Its reviews were mixed, with Variety complaining of frequently choppy character development, and Bosley Crowther calling Monroe completely blank and unfathomable, and stating that unfortunately for the film's structure, everything turns upon her. Despite the film's initial failure, it has received more favorable reviews from critics and film scholars in the 21st century. Geoff Andrew and the British Film Industry Institute has called it a classic. Houston scholar Tony Tracy has described Monroe's performance as the most mature interpretation of her career. And Jeffrey McNabb of The Independent has praised her for being extraordinary in portraying Rosalind's power of empathy. The first six months of 1961 she was preoccupied by health problems. Monroe underwent surgery for her endometriosis, had a cholecystectomy, is the surgical removal of the gallbladder, and spent four weeks in hospital care, including a brief stint in a psychiatric ward for depression. She was helped by her ex-husband, Joe DiMaggio, with whom she now rekindled a friendship. In spring 1961, Monroe also moved back to California after six years on the East Coast. She dated Frank Sinatra for several months and in early 1962 purchased a house in Brentwood, Los Angeles. Monroe returned to the public eye in the spring of 1962. She received a World Film Favorite Golden Globe Award and began to shoot a new film for 20th Century Fox, Something's Got to Give, a remake of My Favorite Wife from 1940. It was to be co-produced by MMP, directed by George Cukor, and to co-star Dean Martin and Sid Therese. Days before filming began, Monroe caught sinusitis. Despite medical advice to, to postpone the production, Fox began as it planned in late April. Monroe was too ill to work for the majority of the next six weeks, but despite confirmations by multiple doctors, the studio tried to put pressure on her by alleging publicly that she was faking it. Wow, that's really messed up. Can you imagine that? Wow. On May 19th, she took a long break to sing Happy Birthday, Mr. President on stage at President John F. Kennedy's early birthday celebration at Madison Square Garden in New York. She drew attention with her costume, a beige skin-tight dress covered in rhinestones, which made her appear nude. Monroe's trip to New York caused even more irritation for Fox executives who had wanted her to cancel it. So that's basically the biggest moment that Maxwell remembers from uh, Marilyn Monroe's career. Monroe's next film, the scene for Something's Gotta Give, in which she swam naked in a swimming pool. To generate advanced publicity, the press was invited to take photographs of the scene. The photos were later published in Life. This was the first time that a major star had posed nude while at the height of their career. When she began 
Again, on sick leave for several days, Fox decided that it could not afford to have another film running behind schedule when it was already struggling to cover the costs of Cleopatra, 1963. On June, on June 7th, Fox fired Monroe and sued her for $750,000 in damages. She was replaced by Lee Remick, but after Martin refused to make the film with anyone other than Monroe, Fox sued him as well and shut down the production. The studio blamed Monroe for the film's demise and began spreading negative publicity about her, even alleging that she was mentally disturbed. Fox soon regretted its decision and reopened negotiations with Monroe later in June, a settlement about a new contract, including recommencing Something's Gotta Give, and a starring role in the black comedy What a Way to Go, 1964, was reached later that summer. To repair her public image, Monroe engaged in several publicity ventures, including interviews for Life and Cosmopolitan and her first photo shoot for Vogue. For Vogue, she and photographer Bette Stern collaborated for two series of photographs, one a standard fashion editorial and another of her posing nude, which were later published posthumously with her title, the Last Sitting. In the last weeks of her life, she was also planning on starring in a biopic of Jean Harlow. All right, so that's the background of her life. It seemed marred with a lot of tragedy, abuse, stress, health issues, and drug use. Some people would say not unlike a typical Hollywood superstar, although obviously not all of them are quite like that. It is kind of messed up that the studio kind of like fired her, sued her, but at least they tried to uh, fix it, I guess. That's that's good. Uh, no comments on her life, Maxwell? Johnny? Now that we got the background, we got the background of her life all laid down? Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> all right, so let's go into her death. So the final months of her life, Monroe lived at 12305 Fifth Helena Drive in the Brentwood neighborhood of Los Angeles. Her housekeeper, Eunice Murray, was staying overnight at the home on the evening of Saturday, August 4th, 1962. So, Max, we'll try to keep up here. There's some critical figures in her death. So, keep this straight. You got Marilyn Monroe. Then you have Eunice Murray, her housekeeper. Murray awoke at 3 a.m. on August 5th and sensed that something was wrong. Although she saw the light from Monroe's bedroom door, she was unable to get a response and found the door locked. Murray then called Monroe's psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, who arrived at the house shortly after and broke into the bedroom through a window, finding Monroe dead in her bed. Monroe's physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg, arrived at the house at around 3.50 a.m. and pronounced her dead at the scene. At 4.25 a.m., they notified the Los Angeles Police Department. Monroe died between 8.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. on August 4th. The toxicology report revealed that the cause of death was acute barbiturate poisoning. She had 8 milligrams per 100 milliliters of solution, chloral hydrate, and 4.5 milligram percentage of pentobarbital or nembutol in her blood, and 13 milligram percentage of pentobarbital in her liver. Empty medicine bottles were found next to her bed. The possibility that Monroe had accidentally overdosed was ruled out because the dosages found in her body were several times over the lethal limit. The Los Angeles County Coroner's Office was assisted in their investigation by the Los Angeles Suicide Prevention Team, who had expert knowledge on suicide. Monroe's doctor stated that she had been prone to several fears and frequent depressions, with abrupt and unpredictable mood changes, and had overdosed several times in the past, possibly intentionally. Due to these facts and the lack of any indication of foul play, Deputy Coroner Thomas Noguchi classified her death as a probable suicide. Monroe was an international star, and her sudden death was front page news in the US and Europe. According to Lois Banner, it's said that the suicide rate in Los Angeles doubled the month after she died. The circulation rate of most newspapers ex expanded that month. 
and the Chicago Tribune reported that they had received hundreds of phone calls from members of the public who were requesting information about her death. French artist Jean Cousteau, Crustacean. Jean Cousteau commented that her death should serve as a terrible lesson to all those whose chief occupations consist of spying on and tormenting film stars. Her former co-star, Lawrence Oliver, deemed her the complete victim of Ballyhoo and Sensation. And bus stop director Joshua Logan stated that she was one of the most underappreciated people in the world. Her funeral held at the Westwood Village Memorial Park Cemetery on August 8th was private and attended by only her closest associates. The service was arranged by D Joe DiMaggio and her business manager, Inez Melson. Hundreds of spectators crowded the streets around the cemetery. Monroe was later entombed at Crypt Number 24 at the Corridor of Memories. In the following decades, several conspiracy theories, including murder and accidental overdose, have been introduced to contradict suicide as the cause of Monroe's death. The speculation that Monroe had been murdered first gained mainstream attention with the publication of Norman Mailer's Marilyn, a biography, in 1973, and the following years became widespread enough for the Los Angeles County District Attorney John Van de Kamp to conduct a threshold investigation in 1982 to see whether a criminal investigation should be opened. No evidence of foul play was found. Hmm. So, Maxwell, let's see if you could follow the details. There's not that many here. Eunice Murray awoke at 3 a.m., light under the door, but the door was locked. She called the psychiatrist, Ralph Greenson, arrived at the house, broke into the bedroom through the window, finding Monroe dead in her bed. Then we have Monroe's physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg, arrived at the house at 3.50. Why would they not call the police immediately? Does that find, do, you, do you guys find that strange? So the psychiatrist shows up, he finds her dead. Why is he going to call her doctor? Call an ambulance. Yeah, like, that is pretty weird. That doesn't make any sense. So let's let's get into some of the some of the conspiracies here. So there's a few write-ups that were done that are pretty good online. The assassination is one of the three conspiracies alive today. Many believe that Robert Kennedy may have committed the crime himself. It was rumored that not only had he shared secrets that could bring down his family, but his brother, JFK shared secrets as well. It was rumored that Monroe was delusional and believed she would become the next first lady. Even though the affair with Robert Kennedy was never proven, witnesses place him near Monroe's home during the night of her death. I don't know who these witnesses are. We're going to have to... Uh, <laughs> they got uh, Robert Kennedy near yeah. his ho her house? Yeah. So he was in California. He was in California, yes, but the question is whether he was in that area or not. Another outlandish conspiracy theory is that Marilyn Monroe's death was caused by the Mafia. RFK was all about stopping the Mafia's rise to power. Perhaps they killed Monroe in their vengeance against the Kennedy brothers. Another conspiracy of Monroe's death is it's rumored that the government helped cover it up. Phone records were destroyed that night along with Monroe's personal diaries. So if that's true, we're going to have to track that down, but if all our stuff was destroyed, I mean, that's kind of weird. She could have done it herself, too. <laughs> the most logical, yeah, that's a good point, if she was suicidal and she wanted to destroy all her stuff. But wait, how could she destroy her own phone records, though? Oh, that I don't know. I thought there was, like, other stuff, like, in the room, like a diary. So. Yeah, yeah, those were destroyed as well, but... uh. It's also, it's not clear at what point were they destroyed. Were they discovered? Wait, wait, how, did, how did they know that it existed? It's, well, I don't know. Well, of course, phone records would exist because you have to check whatever she, but, whatever she called. But, but, but knowing about diaries, I don't know. Yeah, we're going to have to track that down because if the diaries were discovered after her death and then however much time later, up, we don't know where they went. They were all destroyed. That's kind of weird. But the most logical of the three conspiracies, it was an accident. She was killed from a rectally administered barbiturate enema. Don't you have those frequently, Maxwell? Wait, they, they, they prove it that? No, it's just as a theory. Um, 
Um, so someone had to have administered the enema. The theory is Dr. Greenson, who worked with her main doctor, Dr. Engelberg, accidentally overdosed her because she, uh, because he did not realize she was taking other medication. Milton Rudin, Monroe's attorney, insisted he heard Dr. Greenson confess that he did not know about the other prescriptions. A good doctor would not want to admit that he or she had made a mistake, especially a high-profile case like this one. The last conspiracy theory is that Marilyn Monroe committed suicide. There is little evidence to support this theory. When she was found, she was lying face down in her pillow with sleeping pills scattered beside her. Generally, an overdose of sleeping pills would cause one to vomit and for the legs to cramp up. This did not seem to occur with Monroe. This led many to believe it was not a suicide. According to reports, she died sometime before 4 a.m., but the police were not called until much later. The theory is that the advertisement department of 20th Century Fox Film Corporation had to give them the okay to call the police, but that is a far-fetched rumor. Most likely, it was everyone covering themselves to make sure they did not get caught. So the sleeping pill bottles were allegedly strategically arranged near her bed, as if someone tossed them to make it look like she took the sleeping pill. So the actual coroner's finding states, Miss Monroe has suffered from psychiatric disturbance for a long time. On more than one occasion, when disappointed or depressed, she has made a suicide attempt. On these occasions, she had been rescued. In our opinion, the same pattern was repeated on August 4th, except for the rescue. But not everyone is so sure, including one of the actresses who played her. The new Lifetime miniseries, The Secret Life of Marilyn Monroe, makes it seem as if Monroe was in and out of mental hospitals. According to Kelly Garner, who plays the sex symbol in the film, said it's like historical fiction during an interview with foxnews.com. I've heard so many different things, Garner said. I don't want to think that she killed herself. That's a hard one for me. That one makes me sad. The UK's Metro reported that it happened, quote, many times before her untimely death, referring to overdoses. So they were alleging that she had overdosed multiple times. But once again, if she was murdered and if it was someone who knew about the overdoses, that would be a good way to stage it. So, yeah, once again, many people believe that the Kennedys murdered Monroe if she allegedly had an affair with President John F. Kennedy and also his brother, Robert F. Kennedy. So. And some people think that it could have been Robert who was jealous of John or John who was jealous of Robert or all of that if she was kind of playing both brothers. That wouldn't be the first time. I've, I'm sure Maxwell has watched quite a few movies with this plot line since Maxwell likes movies. Is that right? Uh, what kind of plot lines? What I just said. Uh, what did you say? <laughs> if you can only remember the very last thing that I said, that's what it was. That Marilyn Monroe was, was seeing both John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy, or back and forth between the two brothers. So if she was playing both brothers, one of them could have got jealous over the other and killed her. Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> or at the same time. Some, some would have find that blasphemous, as by all accounts, John F. Well, both of the, Kennedy, the Kennedys are pretty well respected, but uh, yeah, especially John F. Kennedy. You know, it would be crazy if there was some kind of a weird government conspiracy that had something to do with Marilyn Monroe and John F. Kennedy getting killed. If John F. Kennedy told her something, he shouldn't have told her. And then if she got yeah. mad and if she got mad and threatened to say something about it, because if she was bold, she would probably, she probably wouldn't be that scared of, of saying anything. Right. And then of course, Robert F. Kennedy was also assassinated. So what would be crazy is if, uh, yeah, if something that both of those Kennedys and Marilyn were involved in got them all killed. And does it have something to do with the mafia? There's a lot of strange mafia activity going on, especially at that time. In the book, The Murder of Marilyn Monroe Case Closed, written by investigative reporter Jay Margolis and New York Times bestselling author Richard Buskin, the alleged murder of Monroe was orchestrated by RFK and co-conspirators like brother-in-law and actor Peter Lawford after the actress threatened to air dirty political secrets they had disclosed to her. 
Bobby Kennedy was determined to shut her up regardless of the consequences, Peter Lawford said after her death, according to the authors. It was the craziest thing he ever did, and I was crazy enough to let it happen. Lawford apparently felt guilty after her death, which is when he made this statement, the UK's Daily Mail wrote. What the heck? So Peter Lawford admitted this? I was crazy enough to let it happen. So I, I guess he's alleging that, that Bobby Kennedy mentioned something to him and he didn't do anything about it. So that's what he means by let it happen, not that he actually helped. But uh, yeah, the murder supposedly was conducted by giving her a lethal injection via enema. Traces of pills were not found in her stomach during the autopsy. And nothing to drink the pills with was discovered in the room either. There also wasn't any vomit, which is usually what happens when a person overdoses. So what do you guys think about that? So you think overdose is unlikely due to face down position, no pills in her stomach, no vomit, and strange timeline of them not calling an ambulance right away. Wait, uh, no needles were found? No needles uh, into her arm or anything? Like needle holes? Supposedly not, no. Then I would go with the enema route. Can't they detect that in there or no? What? I don't know if there's something that was placed in there. <laughs> I I don't know, but from the autopsy, it seems like it was just the presence in her liver and in her bloodstream, barbiturates. So the mafia comes into play for several reasons, Metro noted. They either wanted to frame the Kennedys to make it look like they were guilty, or the mafia murdered her for the Kennedys. <laughs> so what do you think? Uh, we need her diaries. <laughs> You think she actually, you think she would write that in her diary, whatever political secrets that were told to her? I mean, they were destroyed for some reason, so there had to have been something good in there. I mean, yeah, if she was killed, I mean, she, and didn't actually overdose herself, she had to have known something. Or just... Or, or not necessarily, if, if one of the brothers was getting jealous, if it was the Kennedy brothers. Huh. Or there could be something we don't know about, like... So a lot of those uh, studio bosses have been involved in mafia matters and murders before. You know, when you're talking millions of dollars and contracts, they could have just put out a hit on her. They could have paid off her doctor. They could have paid off her psychiatrist. I mean, that's how people do these things, right? So if, if there was some kind of a business deal. So here's, yeah, so here's a report from, uh, from Variety from 2010. Monroe's autopsy report did not note the presence of any sort of residue that would have been left behind the 50 or so pills she allegedly popped, as well as that Miss Murray, her housekeeper, waited several hours after finding Miss Monroe's dead body before contacting the authorities. Then there are the missing phone records that would have shown just who Miss Monroe called on the night she died, who Miss Murray called on the morning she was found. So we don't have any of that information for some reason. There, of course, there are the most horrific and salacious theories that Miss Monroe was snuffed out by the Kennedy family so that she would not publicly spill the beans on her alleged affairs with both John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, who both, it is believed by some, may have told Miss Monroe any number of politically explosive tidbits that she may or may not have recorded in her diaries that apparently, and according to some theories, also went missing in the hours and days after her death. So it seems like she did not destroy them. So it seems like they were present and then they were taken or destroyed by somebody. Were they in photographs at all? Or no? I guess it was done. Uh, yeah, there are photographs from the police that first arrived and photos of them uh, taking the body out of the house. What, uh, but, no, what... No, but no diaries of it? No diaries in the photos? It would be unclear... Yeah, it's unclear. I mean, there's books, notebooks and stuff, but uh, yeah, it's unclear where the diaries would have been. I don't know if it was just lying around wherever, but how would you know which was the diary and which was, like, maybe there were multiple diaries. Some of them went missing, some of them didn't. Are you guys ready for the alien conspiracies? It's what you've been waiting for, Maxwell? Yeah, I don't know. What? I don't know. I don't believe in aliens. You don't believe in aliens? Nah. This was uh, posted on The Inquisitor, June 6, 2017. CIA murdered Marilyn Monroe to stop her from disclosing that JFK saw Roswell UFO documentary claims. 
A new documentary titled Unacknowledged features UFO investigator and ET conspiracy theorist Dr. Stephen Greer pushing the bizarre claim that Marilyn Monroe was murdered by the CIA after she threatened to leak top secret information she obtained from her lover, President John F. Kennedy, about the alien UFO that allegedly crashed at a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico in July of 1947. Unacknowledged claims that Monroe was having affairs with both JFK and his brother, Robert Kennedy. She was murdered in a CIA-orchestrated plot after she threatened to revenge against JFK and Robert for breaking up with her. She threatened to expose the U.S. government cover-up of information about aliens and extraterrestrial visitors to Earth. The evidence that supports the bizarre conspiracy, according to Greer, comes from a top-secret CIA memo produced two days before Monroe died that reveals that Monroe's phone was wiretapped and that the agency knew Monroe was planning to reveal that JFK visited a secret airbase where he saw the remains of the UFO that allegedly crashed at Roswell. But a CIA spokesperson, Jonathan Liu, has reportedly denied the claims contained in the alleged top secret CIA memo. Well, what would we expect him to do? Like, let's say the claims were legit and the memo is legit. Would we expect them to confirm that it's legit or would they deny? I mean, I, it, it's always weird to me how people can take at face value, government agents denying something that's classified. What do you guys think about that? I don't know. I'm just wondering why he would tell her that. <laughs> yeah, but hold on. Let's focus on the CIA memo, though. If the CIA memo is legit, that means they tapped her phone and they knew she was involved in something top secret. Because we knew the FBI had a file on her for her connections to, commu to, to her husband with communism and stuff, which is completely different than a, CIA than a CIA file having to do with extraterrestrials. No thoughts, Maxwell? I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know why, why they wouldn't just let it go and just let the disbelief take over. Because I just oh, why, why they didn't let Ma Marilyn just say whatever she was going to say and then just call her in crazy? Yeah. Like, yeah, that's a good I point. Think, that's a good point. I just think, I don't know, man. It's just weird. The CIA spokesperson told Express such claims are baseless and do not merit serious consideration. However, the spokesperson refused to comment further when asked why the CIA has not made any effort to stop Greer from making false allegations of murder against the agency. <laughs> in the film directed by Michael Mazzola, Greer claimed that Monroe did not die from a drug overdose. Instead, she was murdered after she threatened to reveal secrets about UFOs and aliens that she obtained from JFK. However, some skeptics have accused the producers of Unacknowledged of exploiting the fact that more than 50 years after Monroe was found dead in her 12305 Fifth Helena Drive home in Los Angeles, controversy continues to swirl around the cause of her death. The controversy persists in conspiracy theory circles, though the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office had ruled Monroe's death a probable suicide. Accidental overdose was ruled out after it was found that she had ingested a huge amount of barbiturates. Conspiracy theory claims that Monroe did not commit suicide but was murdered became very popular in the 1970s. Most conspiracy theories about her death involved President John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert, who allegedly had separate affairs with Monroe. The persistence of the rumors in the media during the 1970s and the early 1980s forced the office of the Los Angeles County District Attorney to review the case in 1982, looking at the possibility of opening a criminal investigation, but the investigators found no credible evidence to support any of the popular theories that Monroe was murdered. But if they had found evidence... And they had found that it might have been some kind of government involvement that they didn't want to open the can of worms. Obviously, they would say that there was no evidence to keep the lid on that, especially if there was something CIA involved. So I don't know why people, though, it, it's so weird how people never, never logically approach it from that angle. Because if you don't know what the truth is, you're not just going to assume things. Because if it was some kind of top secret government involvement, that could never be known, especially not by a standard LAPD investigation. So they, they, of course, they would never want an investigation. So, however, in his new documentary, Unacknowledged, ufologist and ET conspiracy theorist, Dr. Stephen Greer, founder of the Center of Study for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, claims that evidence obtained from top secret CIA documents suggests that JFK had shared highly classified information about the alleged Roswell UFO incident with Monroe.
The CIA was aware and concerned about the relationship between Monroe and JFK. The agency allegedly feared that Kennedy could accidentally or deliberately leak sensitive information to Monroe, who was known to have been struggling with substance abuse and mental health issues. But to Maxwell's point, if she's struggling with mental health issues, nobody would have believed her anyway, probably. I don't know. The agency therefore began wiretapping Monroe's phone calls to monitor her conversations. Greer claimed to have obtained a top secret memo allegedly produced by the CIA two days before Monroe died and a transcript of a phone call between Monroe and the journalist Dorothy Kilgillen who included references to a wiretapped phone call between Monroe and Robert Kennedy. What do you think about that, Johnny? No thoughts, Johnny? No, nah, not really. You're turning into Maxwell. So I don't know like, nothing about this. It's like so hard to talk about this. Like, I don't know. Well, it's I didn't know about weird. this before either. Supposedly, there's a transcript of a phone call between Monroe and journalist Dorothy Kilgillen. And... That includes references to a wiretapped phone call between Monroe and Robert Kennedy. The memo allegedly suggests that JFK told Monroe that he visited a secret airbase where evidence of intelligent extraterrestrial life was preserved. This, according to Greer, was a reference to the alleged remains of a UFO spacecraft recovered from a crash site near Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947. Monroe was reportedly very upset that the Kennedys broke up with her. She threatened to retaliate by holding a press conference to reveal the secrets about President Kennedy's visit to a secret airbase to inspect things from outer space. We have a number of smoking gun documents, including a wiretap of Marilyn Monroe on the day before she died, which has never been declassified, Greer said. She was threatening to hold a press conference to tell the world what Jack Kennedy had told her during pillow talk about having seen debris from an extraterrestrial vehicle at what the document calls a secret airbase. Greer alleged that Monroe was murdered because she threatened to disclose top secret UFO and ET information. It's a tragic situation because she was an actress. She didn't understand the national security state and the viciousness of those who want to keep those kinds of secrets, Greer concluded. Greer is a prominent member of the UFO and alien disclosure community. Members of the disclosure movement believe that the U.S. government is colluding with the governments of leading technological nations to enforce a global UFO and ET truth embargo. The alleged truth embargo is designed to keep vital information about UFO visitations and alien contact with Earth as a secret. UFO disclosure advocates, including Greer, believe that a major reason why the U.S. government placed an inflexible embargo on disclosure of truth about aliens and UFOs is that the government is benefiting secretly from access to advanced technology provided by intelligent extraterrestrial species. One of the most advanced technologies that aliens have allegedly revealed to the U.S. government is the so-called free energy technology. But powerful interests in the fossil fuel industry are suppressing the revolutionary knowledge. All right, so what do you guys think about that? Johnny, Maxwell, no thoughts at all? Doing a podcast or what? I'm waiting for Johnny's response so I can try to gather some more information. <laughs> oh, I was doing the same thing. <laughs> Everybody wants to know what Maxwell thinks. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, you didn't follow a single thing, Maxwell? Supposedly... This guy, Greer, some people think Greer is some kind of uh, a shill or CIA operative himself putting out disinfo on aliens or whatnot. There's a lot of controversial stuff about Greer out there. But putting that aside for a second, if there is a CIA memo that Marilyn was planning to somehow say something about JFK or Robert Kennedy, aliens, whatever, and there's a wiretap of this conversation... How do you, can you not remember that? I said that like four times already. Yeah, so so what about it? That's that's a good motive to to kill her. Do you think it's unrelated to her death? So she's 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 wiretapped by the CIA. Oh, it, could, it, could be, it could be related. I mean, if she was wiretapped, that means there was something some secret revealed. So that could ruin someone's reputation, like John F. Kennedy's or Robert Kennedy's. So yeah, it could be related. That's kind of messed up. But why did they start to? I guess they suspected her. I guess, yeah, yeah. That's kind of messed up, man. It is. Her whole life is kind of messed up. It's such a tragic. It's so tragic. Her her life is is very very tragic. Johnny, thoughts? No, not really. 
All right, so one more thing we'll go over. Some people think this whole thing is a hoax, but I will give the report anyway in the interest of covering every single angle in this case. So this is, uh, this is a number of years old now. Retired CIA agent confesses on deathbed, I killed Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Mr. Hodges, so in Norfolk, Virginia, a 78-year-old retired officer of the CIA, Norman Hodges, has made a series of astonishing confessions since he was admitted at the Centura General Hospital on Monday. He claims he committed 37 assassinations for the American government between 1959 and 1972, including the actress and model, Marilyn Monroe. Mr. Hodges, who worked for the CIA for 41 years as an operative with top-level security clearances, claims he was employed as a hitman by the organization to assassinate individuals who could represent a threat to the security of the country. Trained as both a sniper and a martial arts expert, Mr. Hodges says he also has significant experience with unconventional methods of inflicting harm upon others like poisons and explosives. Mr. Hodges swears he remembers vividly each of the assassinations he committed for the CIA. He claims that all 37 of the murders he committed on American soil were ordered by his commanding officer, Major James Jimmy Hayworth. The elderly man claims he committed his assassinations between August 1959 and March 1972, at a time when he says, quote, the CIA had its own agenda. End quote. He says he was part of an operative cell of five members which carried out political assassinations across the country. Most of their victims were political activists, journalists, and union leaders. But he also claimed that he killed a few scientists and artists whose ideas represented a threat to the interests of the United States. Mr. Hodges says that Marilyn Monroe remains unique among his victims, as she is the only woman he ever assassinated. He claims he has no regrets, however, as he says that she had become a, quote, threat to the security of the country, end quote, and had to be eliminated. We had evidence that Marilyn Monroe had not only slept with Kennedy, but also with Fidel Castro, <laughs> claims <laughs> Mr. Hodges. My commanding officer, Jimmy Hayworth, told me that she had to die and that it had to look like a suicide or an overdose. I never killed a woman before, but I obeyed orders. I did it for America. She could have transmitted strategic information to the communists, and we couldn't allow that. She had to die. I just did what I had to do. Marilyn Monroe died between midnight and 1 a.m. on August 5th, 1962. Mr. Hodges claims he entered her room while she was sleeping and injected her with a massive dose of chloral hydrate, a powerful sedative, mixed with Nembutal, a short-acting barbiturate, causing her death. The 70-year-old man was placed under custody by the FBI, which is taking Mr. Hodges' confession very seriously and has opened an investigation to verify his allegations. The investigation might be very complicated, however, as very few written files are available on such secret activities, and most of the actors implicated in the various cases are already dead. The most important witness in the story after Mr. Hodges himself, his alleged commanding officer, Major James Hayworth, died of a heart attack in 2011. Two of the other three CIA assassins identified by Mr. Hodges are also dead. And the last one, Captain Keith McInnes, went missing in action in 1968 and is presumed dead. What are your guys' thoughts on that one? I guess that's it. He did it. That seems pretty incredible to me. Like, how, uh, what year was that confessed? The earliest, the earliest story of this I can find is 2015, but uh, it might have been circulating earlier. They're just news reports, so a lot of people are saying that they're kind of it, this is this whole thing is a hoax. Re it's not clear whether they're regarding the story as a hoax or that this guy was they they checked this guy's background out and this was just delusional or something, and he just made up the story and they couldn't verify anything about him, so they're calling it a hoax. It's unclear, or if this is a real report. And this is actually real, and it was verified. Then, of course, they would say it's a hoax, right? To put the lid on it. <laughs> it's just, it's kind of weird how, like, what do people, what does the public expect to happen if it's not a hoax? Like, if this could be verified in any way, they would shut it down so quick. Yeah. Johnny, any thoughts on this deathbed confession? Uh, no. So you think it's all BS, Johnny? 
They see, yeah, it's it's hard to verify a lot of this stuff because if it is all top secret stuff, it's uh, yeah, it's weird. All right, I'm just gonna close with some oddities. I found a very interesting uh, write up by a, a very astute redditor. A few years ago, I read several books on her life and death, and I believe the Kennedys had her killed to silence her. She was involved with both John and Bobby. There was physical evidence such as no pill residue on her stomach and no water or liquids found in her room in which to swallow the supposed pills. Some of her organs vanished from the morgue, as did some autopsy paperwork. Also, two ambulance drivers responded to a 911 call hours before her housekeeper claimed to have discovered her. These two EMTs said there were men in suits at her house. They passed lie detector tests at different points in time. Also, her housekeeper in later years hinted in being forced to lie about the night Marilyn died. She was even recorded on camera making a remark after an interview. I recall a theory that Marilyn was given an injection into her armpit that killed her. It appeared she overdosed and left no marks. Bobby Kennedy was proven to have been in California that night and some have placed him at the scene. So this is a very interesting comment, and we're going to have to track all of this down in the next episode. But it seems like there were sources that reported that there was an earlier 911 call, and that the, there were men in suits in her house. So does that mean FBI, CIA, or mafia? You know what's funny? The mafia guys usually wear suits too, right? <laughs> So if they saw suit guys in suits in her in her uh, in her house, that doesn't tell us exactly who they were, right? <laughs> Why does the mafia dress the same way as uh, FBI and CIA agents? That's kind of weird. Both the same thing. Oh, that's a new Johnny Mills theory. Oh man, that one's crazy. That one's crazy. So we went over quite a few rabbit holes. We got aliens. We got mafia. We got FBI, CIA cover ups. A lot of strange things happening, and we will continue to examine and go down more of these rabbit holes in the next episode. We hope you enjoyed another edition of Mindshock True Crime. If you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Like our Facebook page. You can also check us out, Twitter, Reddit, Patreon, where if you become a patron, you can uh, submit your own request, which we will get to very, very quickly. Any thoughts, questions, comments, theories of your own, feel free to drop them in the comments section for discussion. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. And Matthew Power. And Johnny Mills. We'll catch you guys next time. <laughs>